up by the Babylonian culture and the customs they had. No, they sought to keep their identity as servants of the Most High God. And that's the, the title then for the message this morning. They wanted to be servants of the Most High God, the, the only true God. And the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, will you bow? And we see this mainly from verse 1 to 15. Will you bow? Well, what's happening? King Nebuchadnezzar has made this massive statue of gold. It is a huge, like 10-story tall building, some 30 meters. But it's only 3 meters wide, a massive statue there on this plain in Babylon. He seems to have forgotten his own conclusion at the end of chapter 2 that Daniel's God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. And this God who had told them that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom would not last forever. Remember, only the, the head of that statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream was of gold. Only God's kingdom lasts forever. But now Nebuchadnezzar just boldly, proudly goes against that and he's put up an entire statue of gold and he wants everybody to worship him, worship his God. Nebuchadnezzar forgot about the stone that crushed that statue in his dream. And he wants to make this point now, no, my reign will never end. We see this still today, don't we? If you think about a nation like North Korea and the Kim Jong-un putting up statues for him and his dad and granddad and people have to worship it and it's all really, really terrible. It seems to be quite common among dictators then that they have some sort of God syndrome. They, they want to be worshipped. They become megalomaniacs and, and yes, they become tyrants too. See verse 6. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into the fiery furnace. You could say, well, so much for heartfelt support and loyalty, right? Because for the inauguration of the statue then, Nebuchadnezzar invites all the important people of his country, all the officials, and we see that whole list a couple of times, all the different officials, and they are brought there together. And he, he wants to unite them all around that statue and around his own reign. It reminds us of what happened many, many years before in um, Genesis 11 when the people built the Tower of Babel on that same plain and they wanted to unite around it, draw the glory and honor for themselves. And Nebuchadnezzar now does the same thing. He says, I'm going to put myself up on that plain and I want the whole world, as it were, to come, bow before me, worship me. He wants the glory. Now let me highlight four elements then that put great pressure on these three friends. Four elements, uh, pressure to bow before this statue. And as we look at these four, we must ask ourselves, will we bow? Will we bow for anything other than the true God? Will we join the world worshipping any of the countless idols of self-determination or wealth or sexual pleasure or ambition or entertainment and pleasure? Will we compromise and give in and pursue a so, sort of low-risk Christianity? Or will we bow down only before the one true God, the most high God? And will we be his servants and, and speak up in a world that doesn't know him and share the best news that there is? Four pressures then. And the first one is the king's decree. The king's decree in verse 1 to 6. Just see this powerful king, Nebuchadnezzar. He is their employer. He is their king. He is the one who conquered their homeland, took them captive. He's the, the government of the day. And he gives this very clear decree, worship or die. Fall on the ground or into the fire. Now, Daniel had prayed in chapter 2, verse 21, that it is God who deposes kings and raises up others. And the Bible is very clear then that we must, um, that this means that we have to obey government because they are the given authority by God to do what is good and right and to punish evil. And there is only one exception. We must not obey them when they ask us to do what God forbids or when they forbid us to do what God commands. In such a case, we must obey God rather than human beings. Just to apply that to today, today's government, we, of course, we are not under a threat of death here as these friends were. And as many Christians around the world still are today, but we have to choose often between obeying government or the country's leader, uh, uh, and the country's leader or, or obeying God. 
For us, the government could make many laws, and we see that in our time today, laws that go against God's laws, against God's desires and designs. When they deal with things far beyond the scope of what they are supposed to do and do so at the expense of the church and the family. We must be discerning then and and wise and bold when the laws of the land conflict with God's laws. But let me be clear as well, then at the same time, we must not disobey a law simply because we find it inconvenient or we don't like it or find it illogical even. Only when God and government conflict are we allowed to ignore what government says and follow God. This can be a difficult line to thread sometimes and we must continue therefore to pray for wisdom. And let's also pray for organizations like the Christian Institute and Right to Life and many others who who seek to support the church in responding rightly to the things going on in society and in government. There are serious attacks at the moment on the sanctity of life, both the sanctity of unborn life as uh, new uh, laws are proposed to loosen regulation around abortion, as well as campaigns for assisted suicide, a threatened uh, a, a dignified end of life and a right end of life as God has meant it. And we have to stand up then to protect the vulnerable on such issues. And another example, um, activists want really broad conversion therapy bans, as they call them. And these proposals for laws are are being discussed by government at the moment. And if activists get their way, normal prayer and pastoral conversations and preaching and and even aspects of good parenting will be illegal if it displays the, the, the teaching of the Bible. Basically, if they get their way, will we soon see a time when we can't pray with someone struggling with LGBT issues without having to fear prosecution? How close is the day that I cannot stand here and preach from Romans 1 without fearing arrest or being accused of hate speech? If it will come to this, when we hear the king's decree, will we bow? Or will we serve the most high God? Second element of pressure, social pressure. Look at verse 7. Therefore, as soon as they heard the music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Everyone does it. They will all notice if I don't join. We heard a bit from Jessica, right? Standing up alone in her classroom, the only one being Christian, you stand out. And just imagine it there then, these friends are standing on this massive plane with a statue in the middle and the whole group crowd falls on their knees and these three friends are standing there, not bowing. We all know what peer pressure is. Every hype, every trend in society relies on it, right? If enough people do it, well, I guess I've got to join too. At school, in the office, especially through social media nowadays, Which things have we basically joined in because everyone else did it? Or has it? So what if around us everyone bows for the statue, as it were? And you alone need to remain standing. That is strong pressure indeed. But will we bow? Third element. False accusations. See that in verses 8 to 12. These verses tell us of the colleagues of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego who are more than happy to take this opportunity for their own gain. You can almost hear them thinking, well, this is the opportunity for a good promotion. If only we get those three Jews out of the way now. The astrologers went to the king to tell all these three friends. See there in verse 12. There are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty, They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. I remember this happened at the end of chapter 2, the final verse that says that Nebuchadnezzar himself had appointed the three friends uh, after Daniel had, had explained his dream. Nebuchadnezzar had put them in that position and he knew them well therefore, knew how they served. So that last bit of not worshiping the statue is definitely true. But the other bit, had they paid no attention to the king? Had they not been good employees? 
Had they not served the king well? I don't I think that's true. If what is said about them in chapter 1 and about Daniel and the rest of the book is of any value, they were closer to being sort of employees of the month every time. These were good men and they worked hard and diligent. And yet all of that is ignored. They brought to the king. And remember, this could happen to you too and me. However good you do your work, however good a neighbor you are, opportunistic people around us might accuse or threaten or betray or blackmail us into compliance if the opportunity arises. To bow with them. Will we? A final one. A final element of pressure is a last chance out. Verse 13 to 15. Fourthly, once they are caught, once they are brought before this furious king, verses 13 to 15 show us that they get a final chance now. Recant or die. There is huge pressure now to give in to this death threat that is looming, right? There is there's still a way out now, they might be thinking. A last minute escape, shall I, shall I take it? Would, wouldn't God want me to serve him a bit longer here on earth? You Latimer and Nicholas Ridley received a clear speech on the day they were led to the stake, calling them once more to retract their teaching, but they did not. So it was for Martin Luther, who stood before the emperor in the city of Worms in 1521, facing what was basically his death sentence too. And he received that last chance to recant, but he famously said, Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. Amen. So we see these four elements of pressure to bow. The king's decree, social pressure, false accusations, the temptation of compromise at the last minute. The question is, will we bow? Now, you probably noticed all that repetition as we read the chapter, right? It's always funny when you read this chapter and those lists of officials and lists of instruments keep being repeated. Why is that? I think one commentator has a as a good point when he says this is the way of the author of Daniel to mock this show of pagan idolatry it is like satire it's sarcasm he writes this is a fearful trial but can you see in another vein what a what a farce it is a god that is made an image that is set up it's repeated as well all the time it may not take away all the trembling but at least you know there is no truth in it So by this humour, the writer tries to be helpful. How farcical this is shows how empty it is. And so there is no need for utter terror. Well, second point then. Brave by faith. Verse 16 to 18. We've come now to the heart of the chapter. And the answer of the three men here is is crystal clear and and very bold. I think in, in a way, this is just as much a miracle of God's grace as the actual saving a a bit later in the chapter. Three men who did not bow, who did not buckle under this enormous pressure. Father God would, would give us the grace to do this and to stand, right? No, we will not bow, is their answer. Verse 17, they say, the God we serve is able to deliver us. That was their faith. God God is more powerful, much more powerful than Nebuchadnezzar or any of his gods. Did you see how at the end of verse 15, the king had proudly asked, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? These men know the answer. Our God is. Our God is. But here's the important lesson. We, We must, of course, say this with them. God is almighty. The most high God can indeed save. No problem is too big for him. But he might not. Sometimes he saves us from troubles in this world, uh, danger, suffering and so on. But sometimes he doesn't. See there in verse 18. But even if he does not deliver us, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of God you have set up. And that is faith. That is very brave faith. One pastor said, Faith is not believing in spite of the evidence, as as is sometimes claimed. No, faith is obeying in spite of the consequences. Faith is not believing in spite of evidence. Rather, it is obeying in spite of the consequences. Do we trust God so deeply? Do we trust Him so much that we will obey in spite of the consequences? Even if they 
seem to be dreadful, but we know what is the right thing. God's ways and God's plan are not always clear to us, but his desires and his demands are. He has given us his word, the Bible, and it tells us all we need for our life in this world as Christians. And therefore, to obey him, obey his word, that is our task. And not to presume upon his plans and think, oh, why, if I give in a bit now and compromise a bit, I've got maybe a better opportunity later. No, we need to be faithful and stick to the word of God. Don't compromise here and there for ourselves or, or even if we think that might benefit the progress of the gospel. The ultimate goal of creation and, and of our lives is that God receives the glory and the praise and the honour and not some human king. Nebuchadnezzar tried here to steal it and he wants all the peoples to bow for him. But the honour is due to God and, and therefore let's be brave by faith. Let's trust God who is good and wise and powerful. And in, in working out his ultimate goal, glory for God himself, God does not make mistakes, even when his servants die. Nor does God make a mistake when you get ill or when you lose your job or your friends, when you are mocked at school, when you are, speak out about Jesus. No, God wants to make us more like Jesus and more holy and more godly. So shall we believe then with a missionary called John Payton that we are immortal till our task is done? We are immortal till our task is done, he said. It's a, a guy called John Payton more than 100 years ago. He went to the New Hebrides in some islands in the, in the Pacific. And from this autobiography, we, we learn of his amazing courage. It's, it's about Peyton had, co- had courage to overcome even the criticism he received from some respected elders for going to these islands. A certain Mr. Dixon exploded at him, the cannibals, you will be eaten by the cannibals. But to this, Peyton replied like this, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave and there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honouring the Lord Jesus... It will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by worms or by cannibals. And in the great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. Of course, that's very tongue-in-cheek there. But he meant it, and he went, and he suffered greatly. But through his work, many, many people came to faith on those islands. And God received the glory. Of course, that takes courage. And so we are called to be brave by faith in a God who is powerful and able to rescue us if he wants to in his good and sovereign and wise plan. And that brings us to our final thought. Saved through the fire, verse 19 to 30. Saved through the fire. Now this amazing end of the story, God does intervene this time. And he sends supernatural protection to save the friends. You can see Nebuchadnezzar's fury as well as the oven rise seven times as hot. And the friends are bound and they are cast into the fire. And even those soldiers who do that die. But then God sends the rescue. Nebuchadnezzar can't believe his eyes. See verse 24. Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly your majesty. Verse 25. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now, this is the first, but certainly not the last time, that we find the reality of the spiritual realm and spiritual beings here in the book of Daniel. In later chapters, we encounter many more angels, and and even in chapter 7, a great vision of the Son of God himself. Here I believe this fourth man in the fire is an angel sent by God to rescue his people. Just like angels were sent to get Peter out of prison in the book of Acts, for example. And although many people today mock or deny such a supernatural invention by, intervention by God, as Christians we should not be surprised that God is able to do this. Our God raised Jesus from the dead. And he can certainly save his people this way too. Now, Nebuchadnezzar then calls out to them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. And they step out and they are completely untouched. They're not even smelling like fire. What a miracle. 
But it's so important to realize that these men were saved through the fire. And although they did not get hurt whatsoever, they did not know this beforehand. They were not saved from the fire. God did not intervene before they went in. And so it is for many of us, for many of our brothers and sisters around the world today. God does not spare us from suffering, from illness or bereavement or loss of friends or loss of job. And even though we all have to die one day, some people are dying before their time, as we say it. But we have this amazing truth from the Bible that God does save all Christians through such hardship. He won't let us go. God gives the grace we need to persevere. He promised that. He won't let us go and nothing can separate us from his love for us in Jesus Christ. Not even a blazing furnace. Shall we believe those promises? Shall we build upon them in difficult times? Because the result here is so great. God gets the glory. Even from Nebuchadnezzar, verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel, rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. And so Nebuchadnezzar's plan was completely turned upside down. He had raised his statue to receive the praise and the glory from everyone, and now he gives it to the one real God. He acknowledges a far greater God. Now, he still doesn't seem to fully believe in God, though. He speaks about the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a quite distant way. And then we get to verse 29, and he shows he's still thinking like a tyrannical emperor. Again, threatening people's houses to be burned and so on. It's not the way that people are brought to worship the true God. Let's be clear about that. Faith cannot be forced on someone, even though many rulers in history have sadly tried this. And just like Daniel then at the end of chapter 2, the three friends receive promotion. They are honored too, together with God. And near the end of the Bible then, we find these three friends in the famous chapter of the Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11. Put it up on the screen here. They are among those who, through faith, conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, Daniel, a couple of chapters later, who quenched the fury of the flames and who escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength. And there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. These heroes of the faith all received the grace of God. They served him. They did not bow. They were brave by faith. And God proved faithful. He give them, gives them just what they need. Sometimes it was deliverance. Sometimes the grace to carry the burden of pain and suffering. Or to keep their faith to the very end of their lives. But in all cases they glorify God. Now in order to be true servants of the Most High God, let me be clear, we must first be right with Him in the first place. We need to stop bowing to any other God besides this God. And we need to worship the one true God. Have you done that this morning? Can you serve him the rest of your life? Do you want to do that? Because he promises then, when we turn to Jesus and repent and believe, that he will truly save us also from the fire. And in this case, I mean the eternal fire of hell. Because Jesus bore that terrible penalty on the cross. When he died there for our sins. He was sinless. He never bowed. For anything else, he never compromised. He never gave in, even when Satan tempted him severely. And as God's wrath was poured out on him, when Jesus died on the cross, he paved the way to God for us who do so often fail. But when we feel we can turn to him and find full forgiveness, because if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, will you serve with me this one most high God? He's the only one who is truly worthy, unlike any human king. He's the only one who's able to save us through any fire. And yes, even for men like Ridley and Latimer and countless other martyrs, that was the case. They knew that their lives were worth giving up for such a God, such a Savior. Amen. Let's sing now of Christ our hope in life and death with our final song.